Uh, I just wanted to go over uh, what, we get, what we've done so far and what we're going to be doing today. So we've been through the first module, which uh, looked at supply chains, demand management and forecasting. When we're now into the second module, we'll finish off the second module today. Um, and we started, um, we started yesterday and we did supply chain design and optimization. And there was a quiz which you needed to do there. And today, oh, and we, we carried on with end-to-end -end connectivity and visibility. And we covered supply chain technology applications. Remember all those ERP systems and warehouse management systems and transport management systems, supply chain event management systems. And then we looked at uh, various aspects around co connectivity, visibility, sharing, and, and legal. We're going to carry on today looking at uh, supply chain master data, a very important part of your ELP system. And, and I found one that's not really handled very well. Most people don't really keep their data up to date and there's bits missing and it's wrong. And it, this is one of the most important parts about your supply chain is managing your data here. Uh, we did look at the case study yesterday um and remember there was that um that uh, uh spreadsheet and then we're going to carry on and we're going to look at supply chain metrics and reports and there's two uh two sections here one is uh supply chain metrics uh reports and score i've spoken about the score model before this is really brilliant stuff now why reinvent the, the supply chain when you've got the score model which you could apply in your business. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. And then we'll finish up with fi uh, financial and operational metrics and reports. So we've got a quiz here with this uh, particular section and there's also a case study if we've got time. We'll have a quick look at the case study and um, have a look at the quiz as well. But before I carry on, I just want to go back because I don't really think I indicated to you the major advantage of oh wait a minute i think i can get to it if i go yeah can i can i i um, know oh it's on the spreadsheet sorry um that spreadsheet uh it's absolutely critical uh where is the spreadsheet Oh, here we go. Right. I think this is probably one of the most important aspects of supply chain management is how can I improve the supply chain and make more net income or profit? Okay. And we saw yesterday looking at the case study we were looking at where we had a million rounds worth of sales and 800,000 rounds of cost of goods, et cetera, et cetera. And we said that by increasing our sales by 40%, because in most businesses, the boss says, I need to increase the profit. And he'll start talking to the salesman and saying, look, guys, you need to get out there and you need to sell more. But even if they go out, and of course, they're already selling as much as they can, probably. And if they do go and sell more, they're probably going to have to uh, apply some discounts or promotions or something to try and sell more product. But even so, even if they do manage to sell that 4%, as we saw, my profit's only going to go up to um, 65 US dollars or 65,000 US dollars instead of the $60,000. So a lot of effort to get very little return. What the boss should be talking about or should be talking to is the supply chain people. And there are two aspects where we can make a huge difference in the profit on the business. And we mentioned one of them was the cost of goods sold. If I can now collaborate with my suppliers and we can together find innovative ways of reducing costs in the supply chain and thereby reducing the cost of goods sold, just by 4%, we're now up to $92,000 income instead of that 65. 
I mean, the 65 looks like peanuts, doesn't it, compared to the 92. So this is a major area to look at, is the cost of sales. This is where your supply chain people should be working to see what they can do. Also, they can reduce the inventory. And if we reduce the inventory by only 4%, we get to $62,000. But by applying some of the tools I was talking about, like DDMRP, then you go and look at the <clears throat> case studies, people on average are reducing their inventory by not 4%, by 30 to 40%, <laughs> okay? And that's gonna make a huge difference in your business. And they're reducing lead times and they're improving service levels. So don't waste your time telling the salesman to try and go out and sell some more product. Go and have a look in your business and see what you can do to reduce cost of goods sold and to reduce the inventories in your system and improve service levels. So I think the message here is the supply chain. Go and look at the supply chain and see what you can do to continuously improve that supply chain. Okay. Let me find the slides. Where are the slides for today? Here we go. All righty. Okay, we got as far as this point yesterday. Getting there slowly. Find my pointer, my laser pointer. There we go. Okay, any questions before we carry on? Okay, so master data, it's the heart of your supply chain systems. If you've got poor data, incomplete data, bad data, you're gonna have a bad supply chain. So this is one area that you need to work on um, diligently and, and not just once getting it right, it needs to be a continuous process. Now, I always say that uh, you cannot run a supply chain or ERP system unless you have what I would call the technical change committee or sometimes called the engineering change committee. And their job is to look after the three key databases in your system. One's the item master. And the item master is a difficult database to, to maintain because it has at least 100 fields of information in there. And you're not going to use all those fields of information for every type of part, okay? So for procured parts, those bought parts, you're going to use certain fields of information, certainly things like suppliers and, and those things. And if it's a manufactured part, you're going to be using other uh, fields in that database. And if it's a distributed part, there's going to be other fields in that database. So managing that database is exceptionally difficult. You need an item master or a stock master uh, policy. And it's a huge policy as to how you're going to use this database. But on top of that, particularly if you're in manufacturing, that, that technical change committee needs to look after the bills and materials and the routings. Okay, so those are the three databases, item master, bills, and routing. And they need to be like mm, pristine at all times, okay? And so that committee is responsible for keeping those databases up to scratch. Now, I find if those companies don't have a, a committee like that that's looking after these databases, anarchy kind of reigns in the system. Everybody just goes and does their own thing and it's an absolute mess, and you can't run any kind of computer systems like that. So make sure that somebody is focusing, a team of people are focusing on those databases and making sure they're in pristine condition at all times. So master data management, we need, um, we need governance. We need that committee. We need methodologies. We need policies, okay? Even policies about how do we number items? How do we number SKUs? And how do we describe them? And, you know, you, you need to have this in place. And you need to have procedures. We want a new item. We want a new item to put on, on the database. 
Now, it, it, it involves a lot of people, uh, the warehouse people, the costing people, the technical people, the sales people, all put information into that database. And trying to coordinate that and making sure that as soon as we've got a new item on the database, all that information is there is not easy. And as I say, you need to have very strict procedures here. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the life cycle of those items with stewardship is being a good shepherd, as our friend uh, Tony, um, Tom Wallace said the other day, accuracy of that data, consistency of that data. Consistency means we, we name things in the right way. So we should, we should always name things with a main noun first. So it's not a 10 millimeter bolt. It's a bolt, 10 millimeters, 25 millimeters long, hexagon head, stainless steel. All right. We need to name things in the correct way. It needs to be complete. Every program that runs in your ERP system at some stage goes to the item master for some information. So we've now just sold 100 of item 123. It needs to know what the description of that is. What's the unit of measure? What's the price of that part? Okay, if anything is missing there or it's incorrect, you're going to get the wrong invoice coming out, all right? And timeliness is important as well. So as I said, put a new item on there, and it needs to be updated ASAP with all the correct data and somebody needs to check it and sign it off and say if it's right. Very difficult. So we need to plan, we need to create processes, we need to analyze uh, use or transfer, we need to maintain and store the data, we need to archive it. Um, we may need to destroy some of the data if we don't need it anymore and then uh, reassess the data and start planning again. So it's a continuous process as far as uh, the data is concerned. So what types of master, master data do we use? Let's typically look maybe at, at the customer file, the customer database, all right? So the, the customer master file is an example of what we would call static data. Static data, it doesn't change on a regular basis. It could change, but on an irregular basis. So static data is in there and it doesn't change on a daily basis. So the customer master is an example of static data, which are files of information that will not be updated often. All right. Point of sale data, okay, is, is uh, dynamic data. This is changing on a minute by minute basis as people are buying products and we're, we're depleting the inventory. So we have the customer master file here is static. And then we got the customer order history. So we can go in and we can look at that. That's being appended every time a customer buys something, we're appending that history, aren't we? Then, uh, so those are the basic files, but we can do analysis and queries on those files. So we can go and have a look at uh, what what has this customer purchased over a period of time? So we can get the sales by customer or the sales by customer location, perhaps, or the sales by a particular SKU. So we can go and query those databases and we can get that information out. How many pallets did they buy or cases? or pieces and what was the weight and what was the volume and what was the price and uh, so we can get all this information out of these databases so static data are going to be things like plant locations warehouses and part numbers and dynamic data is going to be things like forecasts and uh, current deliveries etc cetera, etc cetera. those things that are changing all the time inventory records very dynamic data as we add and subtract inventory in and out of a warehouse, that's going to be dynamic data, isn't it? And that dynamic data needs to be pretty real time. You know, I always say that your system should be like your bank account, 100% accurate and real time. And it always amazes me when I go to the ATM, put my card in there and I ask for some money and I hear the machine going, as it counts the notes, and already on my cell phone, I've got a message saying, 
you know, so much money has come off of my account. And I physically don't even have it yet. It's just about to pop out of the machine. That's real time. And that's how the data should be in our system. So that at any time we can look at the data and we know exactly what the situation is. Data capture. Okay. We need incremental data volume improvement. We need fast gains in data capture, which can be put to use quickly for fast business improvement. For example, things like cycle counting in the store. You know, that's, we need to do that rapidly and uh, it, it can improve our inventory accuracy. So the only way to get your inventory to the accuracy levels that you need to run an ELP system or a supply chain system the only way to do that is to do proper cycle counting. Partial data may be better than no data. So if some partners are resisting sharing all the data, start with what they will share or with partners who will share. OK, so getting something is better than getting nothing. Capture data at source. Pretty important. It's better to get the data from the point of sale then manually enter it later. And I think another good example here, and probably most of you are too young to remember that when we used to go into the bank to deposit some money, they didn't have computers at the teller position. They would write out a piece of paper uh, saying that they'd received $100 from you. And at some stage, somebody in the back office would then be capturing this on the major computer system. And I guess there were more errors and it certainly wasn't real time. Today, if you go into the bank and you give them some money, they will immediately put it into your bank and you, you will see it reflected on your balance immediately. Okay. So it's the same in the warehouse. Whoever issues some material should immediately turn around and do that transaction on the computer. All right. We should have data capture at source. As soon as you start having data capturers taking those pieces of paper that somebody's filled in, you're going to get mistakes. All right, passive, better than manual capture, as I've just said. Automatic collection will have fewer errors and less chances of being overlooked. So if you're going to capture a stock number, an SKU number, you scan it, it's going to be more accurate than somebody typing the number in there and occasionally making a mistake. Overcome fast-paced, hostile, or language barrier areas. This can be a problem in noisy, uh, hostile areas in factories, for example. It could be do dirty or noisy. Or we could have multilingual environments. Um, these can benefit from automated systems so that we have barcode readers or RFID tags so that we can quickly capture the data accurately with these tools. Capture ancillary data where possible as well. So um, it is usually best to collect as much data and other data when it's simple to do so, even if there's no immediate use for that data, because it could be used in a metric or a key performance indicator at, at some time in the, in the future. So collect it anyway, and we may want to use it in the future. And if we do, we've got it. Real time is best, but batch may often suffice. So as I've said, better to have real time data in your system it means that if inventory is promised or sold, no one else can um, simultaneously promise or sell that inventory. Because if I now have 100 in stock and somebody comes in and buys the 100 and that doesn't get updated in the system immediately, somebody else could come a few minutes later and try and sell that hundred stock again. And by the time we go down there to find it, it's already disappeared. So real time is much better. So automatic identification technologies. All right, we've got automatic identification systems, AIS. Okay. Um, automatic classification optimized for storage and transport. So once we've identified the item, often if you've got a warehouse management system, it will optimize the storage. It will tell you where to put it. Or if you've got a transport management system, it's gonna tell you which truck to put it on. 
automatic identification uh, devices communicate um, that what's actually happening at that particular moment in time. So we get types of AIS, warehouse automation. We, we've spoken about barcodes, RF devices, uh, RFID devices, smart cards, uh, magnetic strips on cards or vision system. So warehouse automation, these systems direct picking and putting away. A wireless radio terminal directs the employees or where to go next. Synthesized voice is a hands-free version. So we got voice picking. We've got pick to lights is another technology that uh, is used in the warehouse as well. Highlights a path through the warehouse. Heads up displays provide visual images where information uh, only the user can see. We've got barcodes, we've got radio frequency devices, um, radio frequency ID, smart cards, a card with an embedded chip for identification maybe of, of employees or vehicles or whatever. And then vision systems, cameras interpret visual information such as words and translate them into uh, formatted in readable uh, format that can be read by a computer. So impact of uh, um, automatic identification systems in the supply chain is typically paper free. Okay, so we have hands free picking in the store. People don't walk around with a pick list anymore. They got voice picking. You know, listening to the computer telling them what to go and pick and how many to pick. We've got the pick to lights where the lights flash and it tells you on the little thing there how many to pick. We have wireless and real-time inputs and payments. This reduces stockouts, enriches customer information and service, and we get automated replenishment of inventory is visible. So we can see immediately we've reached a level of stock, it may be in a stock buffer, it immediately tells us what we need to replenish, how many and when. And track savings to offset huge, the, the huge investment in these tools as well. So barcodes and barcode scanners. We talk about the universal product code, UPC, okay, the UPC. This was developed years ago. It's a common barcode used for retail sales. It only identifies the product number, that's all. You just have the product number on there and, and it's uh, where it comes from. Uh, we can't put a unique serial number on there, unfortunately. So it can hold very little information, but they tend to be pretty accurate or very accurate. So we have start and stop characters on here and it actually forms, it actually does a slight calculation. We have a check digit on the end. And if the calculation doesn't, uh, isn't the same as the check digit, then it rereads it. And often you'll see that in the supermarket where somebody's trying to read a barcode and several times and it gets rejected because it's not, it's doing that calculation and it's not getting the right answer. Then we get 2D barcodes, uh, what we commonly call QR codes, which are beginning, beginning to be used quite a bit everywhere. <laughs> you can scan a QR code and get information, can't you? Uh, it uses dimension in two, it uses data in two dimensions rather than just one, allowing it to store more information. The three little boxes you see in the corners there serve as the equivalent to the start and stop characters because they indicate which, which end is up as well. And these codes can store serial numbers, information, websites, addresses, and many other things today. Radio frequency ID, RFID. Okay, uh, it's a system of electronic tags that store data about items. Tags can be read even when under other objects. So a whole palette of items could be scanned at once. The whole idea was that, and originally that if we could put an RFID tag on every product in the supermarket, uh, you wouldn't need to go through the checkout as you wheeled your trolley through a scanner, would pick up all the RFID tags in your basket and you could stick your credit card in and, uh, and pay for the products. Unfortunately, RFID tags are kind of a little bit too expensive to put on a can of beans 
you know it um and and so it hasn't actually got to that point yet but i suspect that sometime in the future rfid tags will reduce in price and we'll be beginning to see them on the products in the supermarket quite often you might find an rfid tag on the carton of products that come into the supermarket uh, so that it can be uh, id'd easily um, but not so much on on the product itself so a new rfid chip is registered online with the epc global network object naming service Okay, and the site gives it a unique electronic product code, an EPC. So there's the chip, and um, we go to the internet, and we get that uh, authentication. The chip is not a counterfeit because only this service can issue these codes. So a reader, also called an interrogator, sends a signal out and, re and retrieves the EPC code from the tag. After receiving the EPC code, the reader checks the internet to validate the tag and retrieves the detailed product data. We can also store a lot more data on an RFID tag as well. We do find RFID tags on some products that we buy in the shops. And if they don't neutralize them at the checkout, as you walk out of the store, they have those detectors, don't they? And it will go beep, beep, beep and uh, some security person will come and stop you and have a look at what you're trying to take out of the store. So RFID tags errors and adjustments. Um, I, some active, we have active and we have passive uh, RFID tags. Active tags, they're a bit, even a bit more expensive because they actually, they have an, their own power source and they send out a, a message. So in theory, you could put a product in the warehouse there and have various uh, detectors. And by tri triangulating the signals coming in, you should be able to identify exactly where that part is in the warehouse. But active tags are a lot more expensive than, than passive tags. So we do have some problems with RFID uh, and things like liquids, it, it, it doesn't read very well. And if you've got a lot of metal, it doesn't read very well either, okay? So it's, it does have some limitations, which we need to understand. So we need to have readers that are located for low interference as far as radio signals are concerned. Um, there can't be any buffers or shields like metal and things to stop the signals coming through. We may need to adjust the angles of the antennas to try and get it to read properly. And then uh, changing readers and tags to suit a facility. So although it is a good idea and it works nicely when it works, there are some limitations which we need to take into account. So capturing and com communicating point of sale data. So point of sale data can be used to alter inventory levels, compute sales data, collect information about customers. And this can be a barcode or a magnetic strip at a cash register or on a mobile device. The last point is about how vendor managed inventories and similar systems rely on data capture at the point of sale. The vendor uses this information to plan replenishment and properly account for these multi-party multi relationships. So point of sale, inventory and sales data are adjusted at the time and place of the sale. So this is exactly what happens when you check out of the supermarket with your, with your groceries. Information is collected about the customer at the time of sale. They could collect information about you. If you've got a loyalty card, for example, then the company knows who you are and they know what things you like to buy. Mobile devices can collect point of sale data as well. And uh, certainly, as we said, it's needed for vendor managed inventory because now the supplier or the vendor can see what is disappearing out of that inventory and can plan, can plan to replenish that inventory, 
maybe even on a daily basis. Sold 10 today, so we're going to sell and send another 10 over to replenish what was purchased yesterday. Some of the benefits, we can capture data on SKUs, promotions, inventory. We're tending now to replenish push with pull. So instead of pushing things down maybe to the supermarket, we're actually pulling out of the supermarket and uh, replenishing what has been pulled out of that particular buffer or that particular stock. Um, also inventory deductions to finance as well. So we can see that as inventory is taken out, the value of inventory in our store or uh, in our warehouse is being, is being depleted. Collect purchasing habits of supplier of your customers. This can be useful marketing information. So you can target promotions to customers that like to buy that type product or that type of product. It does help us to reduce the bullwhip effect by having a pull system at the end of the supply chain there. Uh, it does reduce data entry errors. Um, before we had barcodes, and again, probably most of you are not old enough to have experienced that, but in supermarkets, the checkout people used to type in the price uh, of each item that went through, and we never collected the item number because there were no barcodes uh, at that point in time, and they made a lot of mistakes. So one was always really careful to see what price they were typing in to the computer um, for each product that went through, because they did make a lot of mistakes. But with barcoding, of course, that reduced significantly. Reduce data entry errors, absolutely, and then low cost updates as well. So model and data validation. Um, information and computer models are used to make decisions that could affect profitability or business survival. Therefore, it's important to validate that the data and the models are working correctly. So we need to test with historical data. We have a model, we can test it with historical data. We can also then test with current data and we can measure errors related to aggregation. And sometimes we want to aggregate our information for specific purposes. And if we do aggregate data, it smooths out the peaks and valleys. Um, pooling random variables reduces a variance of aggregated, varia, uh, of, uh, aggregated variable. And it's easier to interpret less data. So peaks in one set of items and the valleys in another set the item tends to average each other out when groups of items are aggregated or combined. For example, inventory at a warehouse will have some items at maximum inventory and some are at minimum inventory and some partly between the two extremes. All inventory in the warehouse looked at in aggregate will tend to towards an average inventory level. Aggregate data is also able to show overall trends and requires less interpretation than pouring over individual units. So sometimes it is, it's beneficial to aggregate our data up and we can look at those averages and we can look at trends. Any questions so far? Okay, let's talk about decision support systems, DSS, and big data. So decision, uh, decision support systems, or DSS, helps with management decision-making by providing logical, usually quantitative, analysis of the relevant factors. So what happens? Management has a business to question to ask. They enter the business scenario into the DSS. Okay, so management formulates a business scenario and requests the DSS system to evaluate and analyze it. The demand, uh, sorry, the, the 
the uh, decision support system queries the ERP systems databases to retrieve the relevant record. Okay, so we're going into the ERP system databases to pull out the information that we need. Then number three, the decision support system puts the information into context, generates ratios or statistics, and then presents the various alternatives to management along with their advantages and trade-offs. All right, and therefore, number four, then um, the information is presented in a format that's easy for the decision maker to interpret. And this could be a dashboard if the information is needed every day. Okay, so we get the presentation of that information. And typically dashboards work like this. So a manager wants to see what's happened yesterday or this month so far. So we can go in and quiz the ERP system. We can ask those questions. We can get the data out. And based on that data, we can then make sensible business decisions. Again, we must make sure that the data sitting in our ERP system is accurate, it's real time, and it's relevant. Is that information in there relevant to that particular part? We talk about big data. All right, big data is massive amounts of structured and unstructured data. So we have all this data and we file it away in these databases. Helps us to identify problem areas in supply chain early and how best to collect and use and leverage this data is key. It's a massive amount of data and just on its own, it's just data. It doesn't really give us information. So we need to be able to convert that big data into something that we can use. So data acquisition and analytics, analytics and, and anal I can't speak today, hold on, I need a analytics goal. So data acquisition and analytics goal, we need seamless links amongst procedures and partners. So collecting information, we want to collect data at each point of product handling in separate databases, ideally automatically. Data should be in a format relevant to each user's needs. Okay, so I need to be able to see it in um, pallets or cases or units or, or monetary terms, whatever makes sense to me in my position, in my, in my function in the business. We need to provide timely access to that data as well. Data is timely if it helps with the decision making when the decision needs to be made. Like our bank accounts, we often need to make a decision. Can I afford to pay that invoice or that bill? How much money have I got sitting in my account? Uh, is it real time? Hopefully it is so that I know exactly what I have and where it is in real time. And I always tell people working in the warehouse, that's your job to be able to tell us exactly what you have and where it is in real time. Controlling access uh, to relevant data is also important as well. We don't want everybody to be able to access everything. That could be a, a breach of security perhaps. So role specific information is provided regardless of the communication medium. So we need to make sure who can read or see what data, who can change data, who can add data, and that needs to be very, very closely controlled. We need to uh, reduce visibility gaps. High levels of supply chain maturity provide information such as planned versus actual things like lead times, order tracking, or exceptional uh, alerts, exceptional alerts. And then we need to ensure and maintain data accuracy. Perceptions of accuracy influence systems, adoption and trust. If people feel that the accurate, the inf information or the data they have is inaccurate, they're not going to trust the system and they'll go off and find other ways. They'll go back to their spreadsheets and try and work out what they need to do today, what they need to buy, what they need to make, et cetera, what they need to ship. 
it's very important that people trust the system and they can only trust the system if you're going to ensure that you've got data accuracy in there that people believe what they see in the system and in many cases they don't 